Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assaulter. So last night I uploaded the sex after stroke video and it's literally taken off. So I'm going to do another topic. This one will be a little bit different. Um, and I don't know if YouTube's going to let this fly. And if so, for how long we're about to discuss suicide after stroke. Right. Um, so I'm going to warn you now, this is your one in many trigger warnings you're going to get before I actually get into the meat and potatoes of it. This is going to be a very emotionally charged topic. This topic may make feelings happen. This topic may make discussions happen. So let's just talk about that real quick before we talk about what we're going to talk about. So suicide is an extremely significant and serious thing. There's a huge significant risk to those who have had a stroke to start having thoughts about self-harm and suicide. To those thoughts to become behaviors, behaviors become gestures, gestures to become discussions or any, however that works. Um, if you've had a stroke and you notice that you are feeling like you want to hurt yourself, harm yourself or end your life, please immediately go find help. If you're the supporter, friend, family member, caregiver of anyone that's had a stroke, so the, you're the yeomanry of the stroke assaulter, right? and they appear to be again having thoughts behaviors, gestures, discussions about suicide, self-harm, self-injury, please immediately drag them to help, get them the help they need. You can get help by picking up your home phone or your mobile phone and dial 911 in North America or 999 if you're in the UK or however in the country you live in, get in contact with your emergency medical dispatch system. You can attend your nearest hospital, go to your family doctor, Go to a clergy member, be that priest, pastor, minister, rabbi, imam, whatever the case may be, or, you know, just with the help of a person you trust. Okay. Uh, now, to my friends and family, this is not me, okay? So, if you know me personally, and you see this video, and you immediately light up my mobile, right, because, hey, you okay? I'm great. No worries. Um, so... Uh, people specifically that may be watching this, uh, Nancy, my physiotherapist, and Michaela, my therapist therapist, no worries, we're good, right? We are completely good. Um, to the guys I shoot with, the guys at Option B or Team Fist, if you happen to see this, I'm good, right? No worries. Um, to close friends and family, if you want to chat, give me a ring, um, and we'll go from there. So, stroke sucks. It's a wretched, horrible, terrible fucking thing, right? And attempting to navigate your new normal, your new world is extremely difficult. I know I'm in the middle of returning back to work right now and it, it's extremely difficult, right? It doesn't mean you can't do it without help, right? If you genuinely, seriously need the help, if you need something, say something. It's, it's that simple. I'm going to include some links in the video as well for like the videos I've done on post-stroke depression, post-stroke anxiety, grief after stroke. So you, you can sort of see some of the, the benchmarks behind this or the, the, the thinking behind it. And again, like all the videos I do, um, topics such as this, I try to include the uh, the research links below. So you see where I've gotten my, da my data from. So we're going to talk about two studies predominantly, one out of Denmark and one out of Sweden. For some reason, the Scandies do better research on this. So Let's just talk about a few things. People that have had a stroke genuinely talk about it more, right? They talk about how they feel hopeless more. They talk about how they wish this hadn't happened more. They talk about how they wish they're not in the picture more, right? So they, they are going to telegraph their intentions um, genuinely more than someone else that might be suicidal. Um, because again, you've had this, this, this life altering event that's literally changed your life in the matter of minutes. So now you have to try to relegate your new normal, old normal and all that messiness. So people that have had a stroke, um, or even brain injury, uh, their suicides generally aren't just out of the blue, right? They're, they're something that's discussed maybe with only one person, maybe with a group of people, but they are going to talk about it more. Um, you just have to be able to be open to listen to it, right? To hear what they're saying. So first off, let's discuss the Swedish study. There's a study in Sweden that found stroke patients are twice as likely to commit suicide 
specifically within the first two years compared to those who have not had a stroke. Right? They found there's a clear risk that mental health or mental illness and the risk of suicide attempts uh, by those that have had a stroke are actually underestimated by the healthcare field. So your neurologist, your GP, psychologist, psychiatrist, there's an actually they actually underestimate the, your intentions. Right? They actually they may not be as switched on as they should be or could be because in some cases your neurologist is really only worried about your thinker, right? So if you tell your neurologist, "Oh, I'm feeling kind of anxious," they're gonna go, "That's normal after a stroke." You know, feeling kind of depressy, yeah, it's normal after a stroke. I kind of got the fatigues, yep, that's normal after a stroke. So again, you may need to approach several medical practitioners. Um, best case scenario. Go to your neurologist, go to your general practitioner and say, listen, I need a head shrinker. I need you to refer me to a psychologist or psychiatrist, whatever the case may be, right? Um, and get their help, right? So they published findings in a, a journal called Neurology. Now, they looked at 220,336 stroke patients, right? 220,000 stroke patients. Out of that, 1,217 attempted stroke during the period of the study. Out of that 1,217, 260 were successful in completing their, at the ending of their lives. They found the risk was five-fold, so five times greater for people under age 55. Right? So if you're under 55 and you've had a stroke, you are now five times more likely than the general population of taking yourself out. Right? They also found there's a one-third or 37 percent higher possibility for those that have lower education or income compared to university educated persons. And for those that lived alone, 72 percent increased risk of attempting suicide. Right? So think about that. You're under 55, right? You live alone, right? So right there, you're five times higher, and then you get the extra 72%. So those are some pretty staggering numbers, right? Now, out of those 220,336 stroke assaulters, they follow them for up to 12 years, right? Think about that. that that's a fairly longitudinal study. Um, they followed 220,000 people for 12 years, right? During that period, they observed um, 1,217 suicide attempts, 985 patients, right? So there's 1,217 suicide attempts and 985 patients. Of that, 852 attempted it once. 900 or 90 attempted it twice 43 of them attempted it three times or more a hundred and forty seven of them attempted within the first three months of their stroke and 44 of them attempted it while still in the hospital and out of the um, out of those people, 233 of them were the first attempt, right? They, they, they've, they've only ever made one attempt, and that was because of their stroke. So right there, that, that gives you some pretty interesting numbers, right? Because, you know, some of them attempted while they're in a hospital, right? Think about it. You're, you're in a highly supervised environment. There are people coming and going. You have doctors everywhere, nurses everywhere, social workers and, and nutritionists. There, there are more than enough opportunities there for someone to see the warning signs. And maybe they didn't know what to look for. Right? Because you can get pretty hopeless after a stroke. Um, you have to grieve your old normal to new normal. Like, that's not me. Right? And that's a 12-year study. Now, in Denmark, they did another study between 1979 and 1993 where they looked at 114,098 stroke patients. 
And out of that, 359 were identified as having end of their own life. So there's almost 400,000 stroke folk right, that were followed for a fairly lengthy period of time. Um, and the great news is they found there was no clear relationship to the stroke diagnosis, right? Um, in fact, they found that people that were, that were in the hospital the, f the least amount of time were at a higher risk to actually end their own life versus the people that were in hospital longer, right? So again, how long you were in the hospital for, it actually seems like, well, if you're in there a shorter period of time, um, you're at a higher risk, right? And they looked at um, the possibility that you need to look at five years post-stroke, right? So they're looking at, instead of a two-year window after your stroke, five-year window after your stroke. So they found on the Denmark study, stroke patients are at approximately double the risk for suicide. The risk is greater among younger patients hospital that are shorter that are hospitalized for a shorter period of time and they found that the risk appears to decline with time after the stroke with the greatest risk being within the first five years so right there let's just look at a few things here you're in the hospital for for a fairly short period of time right short hospitalization you live alone right you're under 55 well that's all me i'm still here now does that mean I haven't had really dark days. Oh yeah, I've had a couple significantly dark days. Uh, luckily, I've had people that I can talk to, right? And they, they've kept me grounded. No, they've been brilliant. Occasionally, you've been helpful. Sort of. Right? So, between the Denmark study and the Swedish study, you're following almost 400,000 stroke folk. And again, they've each followed them at least for 12 years. So let's just consider, you know, Scandinavians might be a little bit ahead of the game on some of this research. Right? So they also identified, or what has been identified through various studies, that stroke creates a significant risk factor for both suicide, suicidal ideation, meaning you think about it, right, among younger depressed adult patients, right, and the suicide risk is the greatest for five years after your stroke. Things like depression, previous mood disorders, uh, prior stroke history, a history of depression, and or cognitive impairment all now become important risk factors for the potential potentiality of someone taking their own life. Again, let's just work backwards here. Cognitive impairment, right? How fucked up is your thinker? Right now, let's just use me as an example. I'm in the middle of going back to work. This has been day one, week three for me. Um, really good friend of mine at work. Um, my, yeah, your friend. Um, you've been assisting me the most. Him and I basically came to an agreement. I need to not worry about why I know things, but don't know why I know things. Right? Um, or don't worry about the things I can't remember. Right? It's I get very frustrated because I can remember being able to perform at a certain level. It's drop of a hat. I didn't even, need, didn't even need to think about what I was doing. Like, that's the problem. That's how we fix it. Bang, done. Now I got to wonder, is that the right answer? Right. So I have to limit my frustration. I have to take a moment to understand. Right. There are times whereby I can remember the ability to do things, but I know I can't do it right now. Or I, I know I know something, but I'm not sure how I know it. Right? So, and you know what? I'm just going to have to say, fuck it. It's a thing. I'm not going to get frustrated about it. I'm just going to accept the situation, figure out what the problem is, figure out how to fix it, and then start to rebuild that um, mental pathway, right? Rebuild the filing cabinet of how I'm supposed to do my job at work. So I've got a bit of cognitive impairment. Now, should that be... Resolvable over time? Yes, it should be. How long? I don't know. <laughs> I just don't have a clue, right? Um, do you have a prior history of stroke? If you're on stroke number two or stroke number three, I can definitely understand why you would be significantly more frustrated, right? Significantly more down on yourself, significantly more worried, right? Um, do you have previous mood disorders? 
So if you happen to have bipolar or uh, schi schizophrenia or um, schizoaffective or some other major mental health concern, up until including depression, and now you've got a stroke, so you not only have the stroke, you've got the mental health concerns that you had before the stroke, the mental health concerns you have now because of the stroke, that's a lot on your plate, right? So let's just be realistic here. Some post-stroke patients are going to say they feel like they don't have any hope. Right? People go, well, how can you talk like that? Well, one, you use your mouth. So that's how they talk like that. Um, two, just look at it from their perspective for a second. And I'm going to use me as an example here. I can't tie up my shoes some days. I can't put socks on some days. But not without help. Um... When's the last time you as an adult legitimately had to turn to someone that you trust and go, can you help me put on my socks? Right? Just, just think about that. Now let's, let's up that a notch. I can't put on my own pants. Let's up that another notch. I can't cut my food. Let's up that another notch. I can't toilet myself. Right? So for someone that's been fairly independent you've now had a stroke and things that you used to be able to do drop of a hat you now can't do because of the stroke right you know you feel like a burden you feel like you've lost some some personal autonomy you feel like you lost some dignity you, you know you feel like you are serving no real purpose right and that's how they feel right so Patients who survive a stroke will become frustrated in how they manage and navigate their new world. It, it's just a foregone conclusion. You're going to have a stroke. You're going to get frustrated in how you manage and navigate your new world. It, it's it's going to be a thing, right? I, I don't know what to say about that, right? Because I'm, I, there are times where I feel like a burden. And the people that I lean on, people that I depend upon, uh, people that have been around me the most, I check in with them. Like, hey, I'm not a burden, am I? And they, like, slap me a little bit. Not to the head, though, because that's damaged. Um, and they uh, they remind me that, you know, I just need help. Right? And then stro strokes, stroke assaulters, right, who lack support, have lower educational backgrounds. Um, you have severe reoccurrent strokes. Um, should be targeted as a, per as a precautionary event, right? Um, so, oh, let me just read this here real quick. Suicidal ideation was highest in stroke survivors with current or past depressions for whom the risk was 12 times greater for those without depression. So again, we get back to that pre-stroke use. So if you had a history of depression before your stroke, you're now 12 times greater like there's a potential that, that things could really go south for you and and quickly right so the prevention early treatment of depression after stroke should be the main component when it comes to your rehabilitation right um so I, as i said before when to deal with post-stroke depression post-stroke anxiety you need to look at um when you make a change either in a change in ability right uh, a transition. So when you make a transition, right? Now we'll use again. We'll use the, the, the definition I used before. A transition is either a, a state in your uh, change in your state of care or a, a change in your state of ability. So I just made a huge transition in my state of care. I'm back to work, right? So I'm making a huge change in ability as well. The great news is I'm going to counseling to help me with this anxiety thing because again I get to go back to work in the building where I almost died fun fact so what I want to say is this we've just talked about some statistics the great news is statistics in this instance are simply research data and we can use that research data as a weapon right we can use that as a shield right we can use it to arm ourselves to be prepared for the events where things can go wrong right we can use that information so we can be able to have that conversation with our friends and family like hey dude i'm in a shit state right now 
I really need your help. Right? You got to check me in. Right? Please take me to the hospital. Right? Or, hey, dude, I'm in a shit state right now. I just need your ear for 20 minutes to make sure I'm not going completely batshit crazy. Right? So, if or when, or if and when, in your post-stroke world, you notice that you know you are starting to feel like a burden. You are starting to feel hopeless. You are starting to feel like there's no purpose behind this. You are starting to feel, you know, like life is shit and I don't need to be in it. Right? I implore you, immediately find someone you implicitly trust and beg and plead, demand that they take you to the help you need. Right? If you happen to be watching this video right now and there is no one around you, right, and you have discovered that because of this video, you need help, I'm going to ask you to go find your phone right now. I'm going to tell you to dial 911 or 999 right now. And when the dispatcher gets on the phone, you tell them, I need help. And exactly what help you need. And you're going to tell the dispatcher, I'm going to stay on the phone until the ambulance gets here. Right? They will take you to the help you need. They will take you to get the right assistance that you need. Right? So, we've discussed a fairly involved topic. And I realize that this may have triggered some emotions in people. And I realize that there are people that will be uncomfortable just because this video is going to exist. Well, I don't care. Right? There is a definitive link between having had a stroke and its mental messiness in people taking themselves out of the equation. Right? The stroke didn't kill you. There's no reason why you need to do it. Right? Please, immediately... If you've watched this video and you've decided that this is something you need help with, please immediately go get that help. And on that note, if you happen to like what you've been watching over the past, rolling up on seven months almost, please like, share, subscribe. If there's something you want to see me cover, please email me at strokeassaulter at gmail.com. Um, and if you happen to notice either in yourself or someone around you, the signs or symptoms of the stroke, someone appears befuddled, confused, they're having vision problems, um, they're having a facial droop. They can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. They can't smile equally effectively or at all. They're unable to maintain their own body weight. They can't stand unaided. Please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. And if you happen to find that you are having thoughts about ending your own life, if you have a plan to end your own life, if you are find you're discussing the end of your own life. If, if you've been scribbling in journals, like how you're going to take yourself out, stop what you're doing, pick up your phone, dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.